Hi, I'm Michael Marin. At Holy Name Medical Center, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the important health care issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey. Healing begins here. The Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community. Valley National Bank. MagnaCare. Partners for Health Foundation. Partnering to make our communities healthier, better places to live. The law firm of Gibbons PC. And by Adler Aphasia Center. Helping stroke and brain injury survivors recover their speech. Promotional support provided by NJ.com. Small news, big news, true Jersey. And by NJ Biz. All business, all New Jersey. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You, you got it this? Back. Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Welcome to One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. It's my pleasure to welcome one of the uh, people who really knows sports, but also knows how, how athletes are supposed to conduct themselves off the field. He's uh, Mark Carino, Assistant VP, Director of Athletics at Caldwell University. Good to see you, Mark. Thanks for having me. Let me ask you, how long have you been in the uh, sports coaching business? My entire career, actually. I started uh, originally when I graduated from college. My first head job was at Bloomfield. Uh, first assistant coaching job was at Bloomfield College. Mm. Uh, I worked there as an assistant for three years, and then I became the head coach at Bloomfield College for five years before I moved on to Caldwell, at the time Caldwell College, which is now obviously Caldwell University. University. Coaching in what area in Caldwell? Uh, basketball. You know, I've been a basketball coach all my life. Uh, I played as a, as a youngster, uh, played a little bit in college, but uh, my, my uh, desire was to coach. I fell in love with the sport, and I've been coaching uh, my entire career. I'm very fortunate to have the, the positions that I've had over the 28 years that I've been at Caldwell University. Um, you know, I went there, I, I ended up uh, leaving. I, my first teaching job was at Lynnhurst High School. Mm. Uh, and I left the teaching uh, position to become the athletic director and men's basketball coach at Caldwell College at the time. One year after I went from being a, an all-women's school to becoming co-ed. Yeah. So we started an athletic program, and uh, you know the rest is history, so to speak. Let but, me ask you this. Sure. You've seen a lot of changes in uh, intercollegiate sports. But, Biggest positive change? I think the positive change from you know is especially where, where we are at the, at, at the NCAA Division II level. Do you explain to folks the difference between Division I and Division two. II? <clears throat> okay. Well, the NCAA has three divisions, one, two, and three. Uh, majority of the schools um, in New Jersey you know, are Division I and Division III. There is a pocket of Division IIs. I think we have uh, three institu four institutions that are Division II that are all in the same conference. We're Does all that have to do with size? Uh, not necessarily. Um, they're all relatively similar institutions. Um, it has to do with the commitment to athletics. It has to do with athletic, athletic scholarships. How many uh, you give out? Well, in the, each sport it's different. Sure. But uh, if you mention, you know, we talk about basketball, there's, uh, you're allowed 10 full scholarships in Division II. Division I, you're allowed 13 full scholarships. So there's, there, there's a little bit of a change there. Um, but I think Division Two has the correct idea in relationship to the balance. Describe it. The balance, life in the balance is what the theme is for Division Two. It's balancing the academics along with the athletic component, uh, as well as the social aspect of being in college and, give me, and give handling. Give an example of that. Uh, <clears throat> well, us as uh, a Division Two institution, you know, uh, we are committed to the, uh, the, the initiative of community engagement. Um, over the last four or five years, that has been a big initiative by Division II, um, where it puts us in a position where we engage with our community. Uh, each year, we have our SAC committee, as well as our SAM committee, which is our student-athlete mentoring group, um, you know, that, that oversees 
uh, you know, or entire student athlete population. But give us a concrete example of something you do. Well, this past year, um, one of the community engagements uh, was uh, domestic violence. And our institution put together a walk in her shoes um, where what we did was we had all the male student athletes, all right, wear high female heels. high heels. And we marched around the, the campus. Uh, at we Caldwell also, University. At Caldwell University. We also got involved with the community. So we went into the community uh, and we raised money for domestic violence. For victims of domestic violence. Correct. What was the whole idea behind that? Well, it was to bring an awareness. It was to bring an awareness of, to all of our uh, student athletes and, you know, and our male student athletes of what it's like and, and, and the opportunity uh, for them to get a, gain an understanding of, of, of that issue. Uh, and to just basically to bring an awareness to it. And fortunately, uh, you know, we received a, a, an honor for that, uh, an NCAA grant for $1,000 that we are now utilizing for this coming spring. So we will be expanding that initiative. So let me ask you something. Sure. You know, wins and losses matter, right? Mm-hmm. And you got a great track record in that regard, right? Well, yeah, I'm very fortunate, yes, I do. I have, but I've had a... Describe that first before I ask you the <laughs> second part. Well, I've, I've had the opportunity to w win over 500 career games. Right. Uh, it's about 530, which is uh, uh, second in the state of New Jersey. It's a lot of wins. It's a lot of wins. It means it's a lot of time and a lot of years. The other part of it. The other much, part of it. The, the other part of it beyond the wins and losses. How proud of you are you of the kind of young people you help develop and put out in the world? Well, you know, that's what it's all about. I mean, we're in the education area, and, and this, you know, and athletics and education and the ability to, to have a great impact on student athletes over the years, which I've been very fortunate to, I believe I've been very fortunate to have uh, the great opportunity uh, from the institution to, to provide, you know, these student athletes um, with all the resources that we have and to pro provide them and to enhance their qualities that are necessary to be successful in life, not necessarily just from an athletic perspective, but obviously the overall picture. And, and you know, I've been very fortunate and blessed to have the opportunity that I've had uh, to impact so many student athletes over the years. So, uh, yes, I mean, that is the main thing. I mean, the wins are nice. Mm. And, and the development of our programs at, at the institution. And the recognition. And the recognition, mm. that, that, that's all nice. But the bottom line is the ability to touch young, young students and make them, you know, prepare them for the betterment of their, of their life and whatever walk that they choose to, you know, for their future. Mark, are you building young leaders? We, we <clears throat> certainly try each and every day. So let me ask you this. I have to ask different people this question, so uh, given your role, your perspective on this is very valuable. The essence of building a great leader on the court, but more importantly off the court, is? The qualities that you need to instill in people. I believe, um, you know, there's four or five qualities that, that, that are successful from an athletic Such perspective. As. The ability to make sacrifices. I think the ability to, to, to have uh, an understanding of teamwork, sacrifice, commitment. When you talk about these types of things, those are qualities mm. that are necessary to be successful from an athletic perspective. But in the overall picture of things, those are the qualities that are necessary to be successful in any in walk life. of life that you choose. So, you know, and that's what we deal with on a regular basis. Uh, and we try to incorporate that along with, uh, you know, community service and, right. and, and, being a, and being in the position to provide others that are not as fortunate as we are uh, you know, to provide them opportunities. So I think there's a, there's a great amount of value um, from the athletic perspective, and especially, again, especially at the Division II level, because that's what it's all about. And sometimes at Division I and at big institutions and where all the money is involved, um, you know, it, you lose that factor. It's absolutely um, true. And uh, Mark Carino, keep doing what you're doing every day and uh, make a difference in the lives of young people who are out in the world, whether it's on the court, but more importantly, off the court, making a difference in the lives of others. Appreciate it. Appreciate Mark Carino is Assistant VP, Director of Athletics at Caldwell University in uh, northern New Jersey. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You got it. Stay there. We'll be right back right after this. Thanks, Mark.
To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to be joined for the first time here on Public Television, Michael Armstrong, Chief Executive Officer of an organization called Community Hope. Good to see you, Michael. Thank you, Steve. What is Community Hope? Uh, we develop and operate housing for the mentally ill, homeless veterans, and aging out youth. Let's talk about the veterans uh, operation. Um, you came to us through uh, one of the foundations that work with you, work with us, and told us that you're doing great work. What do the veterans need, and how are you helping them? Well, the, the, uh, it uh, depends on the individual, but veterans have a lot of needs, and our focus has been on dealing with the homelessness, because uh, for most of us, unless we know where we're sleeping at night, you know, everything else is irrelevant. So our programs thus far have been geared on homelessness and everything that surrounds it, also a lot of other issues, uh, housing, uh, vocational preparation, uh, legal services, uh, uh, health services. What do you anything. do for them? Well, do you actually we, have programs that deal with each one of those areas? Uh, well, we have programs that deal with, uh, uh, we have a continuum of services. We have our emergency housing program in Philadelphia, which takes uh, veterans off the field, off the street, gets them stabilized, and helps them get into uh, permanent housing or some other services. And then we have uh, social services for veterans' families. And that program is designed to help veterans and their families either avoid homelessness, or if they become homeless, get rapidly rehoused. And then we have uh, about 105 beds of transitional housing. And this is uh, housing where individuals can stay for up to two years, and we provide there a variety of services, a computer lab, uh, assistance with entitlements, mm -hmm. uh, uh, housing, uh, work preparation, et cetera. And then we have our 62 units of uh, permanent housing at Lyons, and we're actually in the process of building uh, or getting cobbling together the funding to build another 50 units of permanent housing. You know, as we do this uh, segment, our producers are putting up a website. Right. A telephone number. Yes. And we encourage <clears throat> people watching, veterans, family members of a veteran, um, <clears throat> friends, anyone who knows a veteran who may be struggling, dealing with some challenging times to reach out. Um, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric about we need to do more for our veterans. We're, we're not short on rhetoric, are we? No. Um, no. We're short on programs that are substantive and accessible. Let me ask you, your analysis, your sense as to why so many veterans are struggling when it comes to being able to have a roof over their heads and feel like there is a place for them to go at night and feel safe and warm alone or with their families? Mm -hmm. Well, I think veterans are taught to be tough and resilient and independent. So I think a lot of them have trouble asking for help. I think there's also, you know, when veterans come back, there's a honeymoon period. And How things, long does it last? Uh, it depends. Uh, you know, with post-traumatic stress disorder, it can be anywhere from weeks to months to years to sometimes decades. And um, so when that happens, I mean, they've often gone through a lot of things after the honeymoon period, you know, then all of a sudden some of the trauma kicks in and there start to be pro problems with, um, you know, all kinds of problems. And so it often takes a while for them to get to the point uh, where they're homeless. You know, substance abuse, mental illness is often a part of it. So I want to understand something. Post-traumatic stress syndrome, it doesn't necessarily kick in, as you say, as soon as the vet comes back home. Right. Why is that? Well, I think we all have defense mechanisms, and veterans, like all of us, have uh, d ways of dealing with it. And for some, it takes a lot longer to deal with it. They're able to push it down a lot longer. For others, it's much more immediate. Again, it's an individual thing. I mean, the people that we serve are all individuals, and you can't paint everybody with the same brush. And, uh, and so, so a veteran's dealing with a mental health issue, a real mental health issue that he or she may not want to face, they may not be able to face. What impact would that have on a veteran's ability to get gainful employment? Well, it would have a tremendous effect. I mean, they're not going to be able to get employment. Uh, you know, they're going to knock around the system for a long period of time. They're not going to get the services or the help that they need, and they're going to end up... Uh, 
you know, needing uh, homeless services, needing emergency care, all of those things. Is that why the transitional housing piece is so important? What is transitional, by the way? What does that mean? Well, transitional means that they can stay with us for up to two years, that it's designed to be a preparation for them moving on to permanent housing. And during the two years, as I say, we provide, obviously, the roof over their heads, food. We uh, work with the work preparation. We help with reconciliation with the family with that, if that's an issue. We also is it have sometimes a, an issue? Sometimes it is, yeah. Hard for vets sometimes to be with their families? Oh, it's sometimes hard for them. And, um, uh, but uh, again, it's a, an issue that we put a lot of focus on. Obviously, they're often very intent on the reconciliation with okay. their family. So I'm, I'm curious about something. I'm, I'm sorry for jumping around no, here. No, I'm no, so, no. so fascinated by this. And again, look at the website and the telephone number you see on your screen. We put it up as a public service. It's the reason why we do all the programs that we're doing regarding uh, veterans and veterans uh, services. You've met a lot of these veterans face to face. Right. Do most of them ask for help or do you have to push them to get help? Uh, I think it's a mixture, but a lot of them, it's, they're kind of at the end of their rope and uh, they don't have a, an alternative. Often their families have tried to get them help or get them into treatment. Yeah. Uh, they've been through, uh, often a lot of our folks come from, uh, uh, you know, shelters, things like that. It comes from a variety of different sources. You have a couple events coming up. Right. What are they? Well, we have our Flag Day run, our 5K Flag Day run at Lions, and that's a, uh, an event to help individuals can run or walk, yeah. and the proceeds go to help our veteran services. And where's that? The, that is at the Lions VA Hospital in uh, Lions, New Jersey, in okay. Somerset County. What's the other one? Uh, the other is our that's gala. That's June 9th, by the way, right? Yeah, the other is our gala, and that is uh, October 19th, and that'll be at the Venetian in Garfield. And so that's a big event. Um, last year we had about 850 people. We're hoping to have even more than that this year. It's a big fundraiser. All the for proceeds us. go to your organization. All the <clears throat> proceeds go to our organization. To help vets. Absolutely, and the mentally ill. How rewarding is your work? Oh, it's extremely rewarding. Uh, I'm a veteran myself. I'm a Vietnam era veteran. So this is something that's. Uh, near and dear to me. I mean, during the Vietnam era, um, people weren't able to differentiate between their feelings about the war and veterans. So, you know, one of the nice things that's occurred over the last uh, four or five decades is people, uh, you know, may not like the war, but they have an appreciation for the uh, sacrifices that uh, veterans have made. And I think that's a, a big change. Yeah. Thank God we made that change. I'm sorry? Thank God we made that change. We, we exactly. still have a long way to go. Exactly. Uh, Michael Armstrong, first, thank you for your service to our country. Thank you. And also, thank you for the work you do every day for veterans who uh, may not always ask for help but need it. Okay. And uh, hopefully people will take advantage of the information we have. Michael Armstrong, Chief Executive Officer, Community Hope. All the best. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Stay with us. We'll be right back. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. It is my pleasure to introduce for the first time together uh, Elaine Katz, who is Senior Vice President of Grants and Communications, Kessler Foundation, and Dr. John DeLuca, Senior Vice President for Research at Kessler Foundation. Uh, Elaine, I don't want to assume that everyone knows what the foundation is and why its work is so important. Tell well, us. Well, the Kessler Foundation changes lives through re rehabilitation research and funding employment programs for people with disabilities. What makes us really unique is one of the few foundations that focuses on research as well as grant making. How many people are we really talking about that are dealing with the kinds of challenges that Elaine describes? Well, you know, people who are disabled are the, uh, the biggest minority group in the country. You're talking about 56 million people who are, have some form of a disability. What kind are we talking about? Well, any disability, really. The kind of disabilities that we work with at the Kessler Foundation are primarily um, neurologic conditions, such as multiple sclerosis, traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, uh, and stroke. And so that's who we deal with in particular. But the disabled is a huge population. I mean, the foundation um, created from what and why? 
The foundation was created through the sale of Kessler Institute about 10 years ago. Um, and it was really established to continue research in the area of disability. And at the same time, we started looking at how we can give back to the community and began our grant making program. And through the years, we've expanded the grant making both through New, from New Jersey to a national focus. And in fact, the Caucus Educational Corporation is a recipient mm -hmm. of the foundation's, uh, one of the grants uh, to further education uh, in this area. Doctor, let's talk about some of the research that is most relevant to the community watching us right now on public television and files. Talk about it. Give us an example of some of the research that is really relevant that people should know about. Well, a lot of the research that we're doing is helping people get their function back. Because imagine you have a, a problem. You have, you have to go to the hospital. And you need to get your function back, your memory, your mobility, your cognitive abilities. And a lot of the research that we do is what are the best what are the best interventions that we can, can look at and show that has an effectiveness? And so those populations, uh, sometimes in the past, people have just come up with what we think is the best thing to do. What we think is best. Right. So what does the research look like? Well, the research is showing, for example, that, if, for example, you have a spinal cord injury. And uh, the idea is to try to get you back to walk. But if you really aren't able to walk, so what's your, going, your rehabilitation going to be? What we've been doing most recently is working in air robotics, where we can get actually individuals out of the wheelchair. For the, imagine that, Steve, for the first time in 15 years to get up and out of the wheelchair. But it's not just getting out of the wheelchair. The, the, the rehab research part of it is what else does mobility do? So for example, we're showing that it increases bone density, increases muscle mass, cardiovascular health. And just the psychological aspects of getting out of the chair and speaking to somebody eye to eye has been incredibly important for that. And I think that that's an example of mm. how we look at not just mobility, but what's the research behind it and how is that going to help people in a variety of areas of function? And Elaine, one of the areas that we've talked about a lot that follows up with what John's talking about is the potential for employment. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. Well, employment is very important. I mean, it gives you self-esteem. It's actually the first question somebody asks you after your name, what do you do? Um, and for Kessler Foundation, looking at employment is our focus of our grant making. So we have programs both in New Jersey. Um, we're working with organizations, uh, a community arts organization, Matheny, as well as Arts Unbound. And they're actually doing a whole new project where you can buy shares in somebody's art, similar to what they did in farming years ago. Um, where before the artist created, you buy a share, the income provides the artist, and then you can meet the artist. And um, it provides a way of livelihood for a per person with disability, as well as providing um, art, beautiful art for the home. Uh, nationally, we've worked with companies such as uh, PepsiCo. We have a program called Achieving Act Together that's now in five states. And what that is, the Collective Impact Program. So we have four different funders that are together, working together with Pepsi to create jobs. And Pepsi hopes within five years actually to create 2,000 jobs nationally. So as you can imagine, Steve, creating a job for a person continues their independence. It allows them to live within the community and also be, has them become self-sufficient. How much progress are we making <clears throat> with societal attitudes towards those with disabilities and their potential to work and be productive in the way Elaine was just describing? Well, that's really an important question because we have the best rehabilitation in the world when you're trying to go to the hospital. You're in the hospital. We can treat all these functional problems such as mobility and cognition. But what happens when you leave the hospital? That system, you are now out of the system of care and into the system of society. So one of the nice things about the Kessler Foundation is with our focus on, on, on employment and our research on improving health, uh, we have a grant that we just received. But it's a grant to do what? It's a grant Nielsen. to uh, yeah, Nielsen, Foundation. Nielsen Foundation. Nielsen Foundation. Right. It's a grant to the actually The head of the grants would know the, exactly <laughs> where the grant came from. Go ahead. No, the, um, it's to get people with spinal cord injury while they're inpatient to start thinking about employment and getting help with their employment after they leave the hospital. And, and not only are we going to... Uh, help them thinking about their employment possibilities, but follow them for like two years and establish a system by where they can utilize the systems that already exist in the state. Well, how, does that make, how, how would that make a difference? Give us a concrete example of where that would make a difference. Jump in here, Elaine. 
Well, it would make a difference if you know, for example, right now when a person is injured, they don't think about employment right away. Um, they think about getting better. But if the end goal is employment, um, then you really have a, a goal, actually a personal goal, to you need to you know, get together right. with your rehab and to use either robotics or other mechanisms to get working. And the reason you're really um, improving yourself is to get back into the workplace. So right, right now your thought is just on getting well, not what happens after you get and well. And the foundation is thinking about the next steps. And we're thinking about the next steps. Real quick, before I let you out here, some of the other areas that you're into, uh, the foundation is making a difference. Pediatrics, real quick. Pediatrics, we have a new relationship with Children's uh, Specialized Hospital, and we're working with the Department of Education in New Jersey, looking at what happens after a young uh, child sustains an injury, what happens to their education before and after? And what kind of a difference does that injury make after following the hospitalization? And real quick, some of the other areas you were telling me right before we get on the air. Well, we have our, um, also uh, we do a national um, end tide and which looks at, it's a monthly report based on the Bureau of Labor Statistics job report. So for example, last month in October, we found 30% of people with disabilities were working compared to 76% who are not working, which is a considerable dis difference. Um, and we have lots of different programs um, that we're doing to make a difference. The latest one we're doing is a pilot program at Uber in Pittsburgh, looking at how Uber, which is always in the news, can be accessible for people with disabilities. There's a lots of uh, nonprofits that have wheelchair accessible vans that are not being used during the day. And perhaps there's a way of making them available to the community at large. And Uber has talked to us um, and our grantee community options, which is based in New Jersey and nationally, about creating a special app that's mm. accessible, as well as trying to figure out a way to help people get to the doctor's appointments, get to employment, and continue life within the community. And finally, um, Doctor, important research continues to go on that makes a difference, correct? Absolutely. We're going to get people back, we get their function back, we get them back into the community, we're going to get them off social supports, and we're going to be able to get them get employed, be part of uh, being part of their family and by the society again. And we can do that. You are doing that at Kessler Foundation. Dr. John DeLuca and uh, Elaine Katz from Kessler Foundation, thank you for joining us. You, Important work goes on every day. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey. The Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, Valley National Bank, MagnaCare, Partners for Health Foundation, the law firm of Gibbons PC, and by Adler Aphasia Center. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. My name is Dr. John Rundback. I'm actually the medical director of the Interventional Institute here at Holy Name Medical Center. The peripheral arterial disease actually is extremely common. It's one of the forms of hardening of the artery. As interventional radiologists, we perform minimally invasive image guided procedures. Generally, the procedures we do are alternatives to what would otherwise be major surgery. Almost 80% of those patients can avoid amputation if they're referred for us for these sort of procedures. Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey, 1877 Holy Name. Healing begins here.